Although this program was made in 1982, the information contained in it has not been presented in the establishment media. The CIA's greatest operation without any qualifications. It's better than, in terms of their interest, than when they installed the Shah in power. It's uh, better than the coup in Guatemala. Uh, and of course, there are many failures from their own point of view. Better than putting Pinochet in power in terms of CIA values. What it is, is nothing less than an official secrets act. This is the, the uh, legislation that the CIA has been trying for 30 years to get, to give it legal protection and legal exemption from freedom of speech and freedom of the press. We'll begin to learn what it's like to live in a third world country which is being targeted by the CIA. Uh, many Americans have lost sight of the fact that many citizens of other countries, particularly in the third world, uh, have been the victims of, of massive CIA operations, covert operations. Uh, everything from recruitment to bribery to buying of the, an election, uh, on up the line to uh, paramilitary activities and terrorism, training and torture, and even assassination and overthrowing of, of governments. Uh, and I think that Americans fail to realize this until it starts sometimes to hit them at home. And that's apparently what's going to be happening now and legally. John Stockwell, former high CIA official, and Lewis Wolf, co-editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin, tonight on Alternative Views. <laughs> Although glasnost is occurring in the Soviet Union, we still have not had glasnost in the United States concerning the subjects which we'll discuss on Alternative Views. Good evening. Glad you're with us tonight on Alternative Views. This is a very special treat because we have two very, very prominent people in the world of covert activity, experts in their field, and nice people too. That's a strange combination, but we've got them. We have John Stockwell back with us. John was a key official in the CIA for several years before quitting and writing about his experiences in the book On Company Business. His most recent book is a novel entitled Red Sunset. We're also going to do something special tonight. A few weeks ago, we did an interview with Lewis Wolf, who's one of the editors of Covert Action Information Bulletin. Now, this is one of the bulletins which really has been freaking out the CIA for many years because it does name names of agents. But that's just one of the things it does. It has a lot of stories about covert activity and some overt activity of intelligence uh, uh, organizations and semi-intelligence organizations around the world. So you'll find out what happens with coups and various types of activities like this around the world by reading Covert Action Information Bulletin. Well. We were going to have John with us for, to do the interview with Lewis Wolf, but John was out of town. So what we're going to do is the next best thing. We're going to show segments of the interview we did with Lewis Wolf, and then we'll have John comment on them. Lewis and his colleagues since 1978 have been publishing articles exposing the various operations of the CIA all over the world and some of the threats to civil liberties and democracy that this organization has contained. Lewis, welcome to Alternative Views. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. First of all, how did you get into the CIA watch business, and what led you and your colleagues to found the Covert Action Information Bulletin? Well, I've been uh, a journalist since the 1960s, and actually 1966. I spent nine years in Southeast Asia, uh, and it was really there that I first came to grips with what the CIA does in the world. Uh, that its main function, as I learned at that time in Laos and the Philippines, is 
intervening covertly in the affairs of other countries. And in fact, covert action by the CIA's own definition is uh, activity, secret activity, which can be carried out without the knowledge of the targets of that activity being able to learn that it was carried out by the CIA or, in fact, by the U.S. government. And what led you and your colleagues to found the Covert Action Information Bulletin? When did you begin to do this? Well, it was uh, after a long succession of efforts um, largely growing out of the Watergate revelations of the Church Committee and Pike Committee reports, even the Rockefeller Commission reports, which documented gross and ongoing and very large-scale CIA covert activities that had been carried out. Up till that time, the American people didn't know very much about this. Uh, and that was really what the CIA is about, is keeping it secret from the American people. Uh, in, in, in some, the CIA's activities, of course, are known to the people who, uh, against whom they're carried out, but it's the American people from, who are the last to know about it. And uh, we, uh, as a result of a lot of those revelations uh, and a lot of other people who were concerned about it, decided to try and uh, put together a journalistic effort to look into these areas. There was a, uh, another magazine, Counterspy, which started uh, uh, earlier, and after several years it, it bit the dust, and we decided after two years in 1978 to start Covert Action Information Bulletin. Well, it looks like there's going to be some real problems coming up, not only just for you and Covert Action uh, Information Bulletin, but also for civil liberties in general in the United States and finding out what's happening, what our government is doing in our name covertly around the world. With the Intelligence uh, Identities Protection Act just about to be passed in Congress and with Reagan's Executive Order 12333, things are going to be quite different shortly, aren't they? There is clearly a, a, a very marked escalation towards secrecy in this government. Uh, these two pieces of... Uh, or one legislation and one executive order. The executive order does not have to be uh, propounded by Congress. Congress doesn't have a, a single word to say about it. Um, basically, these two working in tandem with each other, uh, along with other efforts by this administration to uh, embed the CIA and the other intelligence agencies, of which there are some 18 federal agencies, uh, in secrecy. This bill is the CIA's greatest operation without any qualifications. It's better than, in terms of their interest, than when they installed the Shah in power. It's uh, better than the coup in Guatemala. Uh, and, of course, there are many failures from their own point of view. Better than putting Pinochet in power in terms of CIA values. What it is is nothing less than an official secrets act. This is the, the uh, legislation that the CIA has been trying for 30 years to get, to give it legal protection and legal exemption from freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Now, what makes it such a beautiful operation is that it is in the process of being passed. It's going through the Congress more or less like a dose of the salts. With the uh, Senate voted on it a couple of months ago, uh, the vote was something like 90 to 2 and the House it's expected to pass by a similar majority, and yet the American people by and large, including med media people, including television interviewers across the nation and journalists, are oblivious that it's even passing, much less what it really means. Now, what it really means, see, it's couched, and what makes it such a typical and beautiful CIA operation is that it's couched in the terms of protecting our agents who are out in the cold, risking their lives to defend the country. This is Senator Benson, was the original sponsor of this bill, by the way. And this was what he said about it in many speeches here in Texas. Now it's passed to uh, Senator John Chafee and Jake Garn sponsoring the bill in Washington. Now who can argue with that? Legal protection from our agents whose names are being exposed by irresponsible people who don't agree with the government's policies. Now, if the facts were that simple, if those were the true facts, who could argue with it? But the truth is that these agents' lives are not in danger because of their names being exposed. The truth is that these agents are functioning from embassies with diplomatic passports under circumstances uh, in which if the worst possibly happens and they're absolutely caught 
buying secrets from some local spy agent, a minister in the government or whatnot, the worst that will, be ha will happen to them, even in the Soviet Union, is that they will be asked to leave the country. Under no circumstances will they ever be attacked or jailed or executed or whatnot. By the government, another government. By the host government, right. where they're living and breaking all the local laws by being a secret agent and, and recruiting spies and inducing people to commit treason. Now, in, in the four or five uh, posts that I served in overseas full time, we had full liaison with the president of the country, the chief of the police, and all the police officers, and all the military officers. This means that we met with them weekly in the name of the CIA, no secrets, to have lunch or dinner and exchange information and do favors for each other. If there were ever a terrorist attack or threat against one of us, the first thing we would do would be to pick up the telephone and call the local police chief and say, hey, there's a threat against us. And I might note that this would, this would also apply in the Soviet Union. If there were terrorist threat in Moscow against the U.S. Embassy or a U.S. case officer or a CI, man, they would call the local police and say, you know, somebody's about to blow us up. There is a brotherhood of secret, po quote, sec secret police agents that functions like a brotherhood even when they're supposedly on the other side. They're competing, but it's sort of like professional football players. They're on dif different teams, but they're still professional football players. Well, you had buddies who were KGB agents. Oh, indeed. Played, uh... played tennis with them, played chess with them, socialized with them, went <laughs> drinking with them, and that was the SOP for all case officers everywhere. 2,000 plus, well over 2,000 names have been revealed, printed, published in the last few years and not one agent has been killed because of his name being revealed. Now, there were two cases where it looked like they were put-up jobs. Right? One in which, one... Which the, the congressman and the CIA always mention is the reason which we they had jumped this on. Yeah. Richard Welch in Athens, uh, the 18th of December in 1975, was killed. Uh, he was uh, shot up by terrorists in front of his home. And uh, at that moment, the church committee, which was in full session, was out of business. Washington, every door in Washington closed on the church committee because as though the church investigation had anything whatsoever to do with it. They flew him back and gave him a full state ceremony, which of course was admission that he was CIA to the world. I mean, the headlines were CIA chief killed. They didn't say uh, the third secretary of embassy killed. The United States government made as much politics as they could out of the fact that this man was a career dipl diplomat agent. Now, the fact was, they caught the terrorist that killed him, and they, they uh, ascertained, they verified, that those were the individuals who had published his name in an Athens newspaper three days before they killed him because they wanted world attention to what they were doing. And it had nothing to do with the investigations or publications in Washington, and they already planned to kill him. Now, this man had been ordered by CIA security to change houses because he was living in the same house that eight other CIA station chiefs had lived in before him. Generation after generation after generation after generation of CIA station chiefs had lived in that same mansion. It was a big villa in a very posh part of Athens. As governments had changed, coups, the colonel's coups, uh, the monarchy in and out of power much earlier, and dealing with all of the terrorist activities and anti-terrorist activities and coups in the Middle East from Athens, with the CIA heavily involved with each government and change of government and the ins and outs in these governments, and yet the CIA station chief was living in the same house throughout. Eventually he was killed. He refused to move because he said it was a good house. Now, there is no way that that can be blamed on U.S. journalists publishing names in Washington. Moreover, as I pointed out, the CIA, the CIA director Bill Colby, exploited that man's death to make a big issue and to effectively close down the church committee. Now, which was investigating the CIA which was investigating the malpractices. The CIA's extensive malpractices. They put the church committee on the defensive and out of business. Now, there was one other incident in El Salvador where two agents who were under a labor cover uh, were killed by right wing, by the government uh, police, the secret police. They're treasury agents is it in, in El Salvador that do the, the, the killing down there. Now, these, uh, these two guys were in contact with the government. They were killed by government agents, set up in a hotel and shot. And the United States announced to the world that they were secret agents. 
Their names had been published much previously, but the United States identified them, thereby admitting they were agents and admitting that they were using this labor organization as cover. Where did they make this announcement? They did it, the, the prosecuting attorney, the state, the state Department's representative in the passport case in which they took Phil Agee's passport away from him, revealed the identities of these agents and claimed that that proved that people publishing the names led to their deaths. They were already dead when the government chose to use a totally fictitious, a totally false ploy to discredit Phil Agee. He had not revealed their names. And so it's now in the Supreme Court records. It's cited by the Supreme Court justices in their decision against Phil Agee and his passport, uh, him keeping his passport, these agents being killed, i.e. the Supreme Court and the State Department revealed their identities to accomplish their objective against Phil Agee. There but was another situation in uh, Jamaica where it looked like it was a plan put up job. That, in that case, indeed, uh, the chief of station's uh, house was shot up with machine gun bullets and so they made uh, considerable pu propaganda publicity uh, out of that with photographs of the bullets but what it's true his name had been published but what happened is uh, the the back wall of his garage well away from the house received five machine gun bullets at a time when his family was out of the country and he was not in the house and yet they tried to use that to make publicity to show that it made it dangerous to have the names revealed. It was also during an election where the opposition to the social democratic government wanted to make it appear that terrorism was rampant in Jamaica. And so wasn't there some political exploitation? Oh, indeed. There that? was considerable political exploitation of it. And, and all evidence points that it was, it was the, the government sec uh, secret police that fired the bullets. Right. But, but again, the, the press in Washington played this as played, cooperated with the CIA to give publicity uh, for, the, uh, for the bill against the exposing of names. So there's no real need for the bill. It's not protecting in any way our national security. That's it's not required by the history of the CIA. Precisely on the one hand, that's the problem. And I, I go a bit further mm -hmm. to point out that th these agents 80% of them were identified from overt information in the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. The people publishing the Covert Action Information Bulletin go to the Library of Congress and go through the State Department's overt records of its personnel and come up with the CI officers' names infallibly because there are little indicators in there which you or you or you, anyone can go in and read through and say that's CI and that's CI and that's CI. Plus, isn't it just generally known in most CIA stations, who is CIA? It's Don't universally they want known. themselves to be known? We used to call to get, it uh, contacts and information. We used to call it wearing an invisible badge. You you acted as though you had a badge, CIA up here. You 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 drew people to you. I'm CIA. Talk to me. You were taught to do this. Mm -hmm. Alan Dulles, and the original CIA great, in his book The Craft of Intelligence, makes this point that you have to be known to be an effective intelligence officer. But see, that's on the one hand. The bill is, is not necessary, and it's dishonest in that sense. It's based on false premises. On the other hand, the bill is so written that it goes far beyond the protection of agents' names. For example, the bill is so written that it will be a felony for agents' names to be published even if they're already, uh, they've, to republish the names, even if they've already been published, as in the Library of Congress or anywhere else. It also includes activities of agents, so that you can, uh, I if an agent kicks in the door of your house and rapes your wife or whatever, uh, and you publish a story about it without citing the name, it would still be a felony. Under the uh, executive order, so we have to see both the executive order and the intelligence identities bill as, as almost part of a package. Uh, under the executive order, the CIA now will be allowed and is allowed since it was signed in, in December by the president. It is now law. Uh, the CIA will be allowed to carry out covert activities in the United States as well as the, all the other agencies too. So that if you were to discover, for example, that a uh, member of an intelligence agency were, had infiltrated, say, your church organization, your student organization, a trade union, or whatever organization uh, or ev any group of more than two people uh, was infiltrated and you discovered this 
and you so much as mentioned it to a friend without even writing a news article or without even talking about it on the media, uh, on television, for example, you could be held criminally liable under this bill. And we're talking about a bill which authorizes or which penalizes persons in, uh, for uh, 15 years in prison, I'm sorry, five years in prison, uh, $15,000 fine or both for persons who've never worked in the government. And that, that's a pretty heavy price to have to pay to uh, try and hold up your rights, uh, stand up for your rights against uh, the onslaught of the intelligence agencies. Now, the New York Times, to give you uh, the, the proof of the, the, the argument that this is an official secrets act, the New York Times, in questioning the sponsors of the bill on the floor of the Senate, pointed out that as it was written, if the London Times published a story about CIA activities and the station chief, some scandal of some kind, the New York Times couldn't republish the London Times story without committing a felony. And the sponsor of the bill slapped his hand on the table and said, that's right, we want to knock off all this criticism of the CIA. So well, the situation that's already come up with the revelation of CIA activity in Iran recently, which mm -hmm. was not published in the United States for very long, but eventually it got either Washington Post or the New York Times mm -hmm. did it, and there was a big uproar because they were publishing it. And the, in the last hearings, the New York Times, uh, questioning again Senator Chafee about this bill, said that as they read it, they would not be able to publish their very legitimate and valuable stories about the activities of CIA agents Ed Wilson and Frank Turple who were selling terrorist technology to Libya after they left the CIA without committing a felony. And Senator Chafee said, yes, in the future, the Washington Post and the New York Times will have to be careful what they publish about the CIA. I should say, uh, uh, if this bill had been law then, we would have never known about Watergate. It would have been, been illegal, illegal to expose it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, but now it will be clear to many more Americans that there is a sort of a split-level foreign policy as there is a split-level policy at home. Uh, there is the rhetoric and then there is the reality. And uh, uh, with secrecy uh, in their vest pocket, they can now carry out a lot of these activities and uh, do it, as they say, legally. And what's, once more, we're going back to the, the age uh, of almost the cowboy politics that the CIA carried out in the 50s and 60s. They claim, uh, as a result of the Church Committee and other uh, revelations, that they don't do that anymore. Well, this administration is not only not saying that, but they're saying that uh, it's now legal, and now they're being very upfront about covert activity. In many, in many cases, the covert activities are now being overt activities. It's been talking about the CIA being the main focus of this bill, but it isn't just the CIA, it's the FBI, where they're involved in, quote, anti-terrorist activities, and of course Reagan has said anybody who dissents is a terrorist and involved in disinformation. That's no exaggeration. That's, That's correct. Right. And also any of the other government or military intelligence organizations. Uh, I think many Americans, as a result of uh, these two uh, matters and others also, will begin to learn what it's like to live in a third world country which is being targeted by the CIA. Uh, many Americans have lost sight of the fact that many citizens of other countries, particularly in the third world, uh, have been the victims of, of massive CIA operations, covert operations. Uh, everything from recruitment to bribery to buying of the, an election uh, on up the line to uh, paramilitary activities and terrorism, training and torture, and even assassination and overthrowing of, of governments. Uh, and I think that Americans fail to realize this until it starts sometimes to hit them at home. And that's apparently what's going to be happening now. And legally, this administration makes no bones that it wishes to, uh, that it sees its own people uh, many of us uh, as the enemy and in fact there are many people I think in, in the country who uh, consider themselves very middle of the road who would be opposed to this. It, it is absolutely incompatible with our system of government as we have known it in the past. Moreover, 
it's written to include obviously more than the CIA. That was the all government agencies that have a right <clears throat> to secrecy will be included in this thing. John, we, this is literally unconstitutional, though. This is absolutely we, unconstitutional. Freedom of speech. It seems to us that uh, there are people in Congress who are prepared to um, relegate the First Amendment uh, to a lower priority and they are more interested in what they call national security. One uh, member of uh, Congress uh, as well as one f deputy director of, of the CIA uh, once stated that uh, the First Amendment, that's only an amendment. Uh, it seems to me that's a rather shocking uh, description of uh, one of the hallmarks of, of our Constitution. This is why I call it their greatest operation is they're doing it without a constitutional amendment which is beautiful in itself. If, this, if they propose to have all the states ratify a bill saying throw out freedom of speech and freedom of the press and give the CIA a law, it would never pass. But on the one hand, they're doing it without constitutional amendments, and, and two, they're doing it without the nation even being aware of it, which says something about the vigilance of Americans and, and their own feelings about their freedom of speech and press. They could care less. They would rather watch a football game. Why, why is this the case, or why have they gotten so far with it without media scrutiny, without public uproar, etc.? It's not just the apathy of the people. Isn't it also that the media just hasn't reported yeah, on what's involved in this? Well, the media in this country is, is, in, is the most apathetic that I've ever seen in the world in terms of playing a uh, ball with the administration. Eighty percent of our news is reporting quotations of political leaders. President Reagan giving a speech in which everything he says is either distortions of historical fact or, or propaganda statements in effect. Or both face or lies. Or both face <laughs> lies, all, all mixed together. And yet the press will report his speech as a fact, it is a fact, he made a speech, he said those words, but they, w they don't say at the end, and everybody in the room, that it was all balderdash. Now, there's a little bit more of that with Reagan than there was with other presidents, because he makes these misstatements so constantly. He gets the facts screwed up so much. But the press doesn't have any sense of defending its own rights. We have had an occasional editorial, including in the Austin American Statesman, saying that the Names of Agents bill is unfortunate. And that's about the size. The New York Times ran an editorial saying, this is unfortunate. They said it was kind of, it was kind of wistful. I read it when I was on my way to lecture at uh, Yale and Wesley and a couple of months ago, and I read it in the New York Times. They were saying, golly gee whiz, they mean this thing to apply to us too. <laughs> yeah, there was another in which they mentioned Lewis Wolf, and they said, well... It's a bad bill, but on the other hand, we've got to take care of people like Lewis Wolf and maybe John Stockwell. They cannot believe that, the, this, that such a thing will actually apply to them. But uh, uh, unfortunately, the CIA has many allies in Congress and some even in the media. And uh, so sometimes you can pick up a newspaper and read some of the CIA's own propaganda uh, coming from, from some of those people. What is the source of the CIA's power in Washington? Well, I think it's uh, the whole idea that the CIA has built up, uh, even in the halls of Congress, that it is somehow a sacred entity. And that uh, while there was a lot of criticism uh, of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, uh, not a whole lot of it while he was alive. It's mm -hmm. all happened since he died. Um, uh, it's interesting because it is known, for example, that Hoover had a lot of information and a lot of very damaging information against members of Congress. Uh, it is also clear that the CIA uh, maintains relations with a number of Congress people, who have, some of whom have said so on the floor of Congress, that uh, they are in close contact with the CIA. And uh, this bill, for example, which was written by the CIA, and they said so. Deputy Director Frank Carlucci said it on national television back in 1978 and said we are now about to deliver this bill up to, to Congress. Uh, that's a little bit of a strange way for laws to be written if they're going to be written by the CIA. Now what this bill is, it's part of a number of bills and legal precedents that the government is obtaining to keep. Now they're not going to go out and arrest the editor of the New York Times and put him in jail for 10 years the week after this bill is passed. They're not that stupid. 
But they're getting, the, they may arrest Lou Wolf if he violates it. I think they probably would because they could make propaganda out of such an arrest. But what they're, they're doing is they're getting that bill, they're getting uh, the passport ruling, for example. Uh, they're getting the other legal precedents, such as the lawsuit against Frank Snap, Marchetti, and myself, uh, and travel restrictions. They're getting authority for the Secretary of State to throw people out of the country who should have political exile here, such as the, the El Salvadorian refugees. And they're getting these things ready so that the next war that they get us into, as in Vietnam, they will have the legal power, muscle, to handle it differently than they did during the Vietnam War. To handle the Senate at home, to make it impossible to speak out. The dissent that choked off Kissinger's and Nixon's and before that Rusk's efforts in Vietnam, the, dis the popular uprising at home that forced the United States government to abandon its policies and plans in Vietnam will not be uh, nearly, the, the government will have weapons to crush such a thing in the future. It'll have an official secrets act to make it illegal to publish stories like My Lai and whatnot because there were obviously secret agents involved. So the publication of the My Lai stories would be a felony. Jane Fonda and Cora Weiss's travels to try to com make communication and establish some basis for working out a peaceful solution to the thing, they would snap their passports up in the future. And, and then the other restrictions on travel, uh, the other restrictions on government agents so that uh, uh, an officer who's been in the service can't stop and say, we were bombing villages and bombing churches and schools. That would be a felony. He would go to jail. It's a British Official Secrets Act with a different name. You know, you were mentioning a while ago, it's not only just the CIA, but it's others too. We had a program recently, which you may remember, about the Greensboro massacres in which the Klan and the Nazis in broad daylight and in front of, of uh, TV cameras, shot down five labor organizers and killed them in Greensboro, North Carolina. And it came out by the investigations that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms agents was working with the Nazis. Indeed, he was the one who gave them the names of the people to be shot. Also, there was FBI and local police complicity with the Klan members. As a matter of fact, it's come out that the FBI itself established over 40 chapters of the Klan over the years in North Carolina alone. These revelations would be a felony now. Yeah, it would exactly. If, if this passes, it would be a felony to reveal such information to the American public. Or government so. of, by, and for the people is is soon to be a thing of the past in the United States. What, what this will do is to put the CIA, the FBI, and these other government agencies outside of the realm of public criticism and even discussion. Or law, law. Yeah, outside right. of the law, right. because they've broken every law of man and God in, in the activities they have conducted, the, the, the experimentation on American citizens, for example, with chemicals and disease, the propaganda of the United States, breaking and entering, Colonel White's famous words about where else can a red-blooded boy lie, kill, cheat, steal, rape, and pillage in the name of the All-Highest. Now they will be able to. Do, that was, Who is this? This was Colonel George M. White, one of the founders of the CIA, who eventually directed uh, the MK Ultra program. Oh. And he was retiring. Uh, he and I overlapped by about four years. He he came out of retirement to address my mid-career seminar, and uh, telling about how we put the CIA together and we did this, that, and the other. In his letters, memoirs, he wrote and then allowed it to be published that statement. Where else could a red-blooded American boy lie, kill, cheat, steal, rape, and pillage with the blessings of the old highest? And uh, that was before they had an official secrets act to protect their activities. John, there's been very few people in this country that have actually told us what the CIA has been up to and exposed some of their misdeeds, etc. You, of course, and a few other former agents have written some books and given lectures criticizing agents' activities. This would be impossible in the future, would it not be? We will never know uh, the truth and the details, the blood and gore, the extent of, of responsibility and culpability uh, for the CIA's program in Nicaragua right now, unless someone like Reagan or in his administ a top official chooses to stand up and denounce what's happening because top officials are exempt from these laws. 
but we will never know the truth about, for example, the Shah and the evacuation of Iran, and which was a, a debacle, I was told, by a friend of mine who, who, uh, who was close to a third friend of mine who was part of the CIA security establishment in Iran who said it was a debacle that far exceeded the evacuation of Vietnam, the, the evacuation of the United States from, uh, from I Iran. And uh, this, this story will never come out. And the many other stories, the assassinations that probably are being planned today, uh, uh, such, a, uh, such as the coup in, in, uh, in Chile or the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. These sort of things are going on, but the public won't know about them in the future. Why has the government been so outraged by this publication and putting so much heat on them? I don't think there's any other publication in America that's had so much government pressure put on them. Then well, you have two forces here. in the government functioning here. You have one is an, an, a defensive outrage against being attacked. Secret police organizations don't like to be exposed and attacked. That's the same anger that they focused at me. People who are performing activities that the, the, the full range of the society, the 90% of the society would describe as depraved, People who are doing this while, while functioning under the cover of being legitimate State Department diplomats, prestigious cover positions, don't like to have their activities and names published for what they really are. This is traditional anywhere in the world. The, the goon squads in Chile don't like to be attacked, nor does the KGB in, in Russia to be attacked and exposed. But nowhere else in the world do they become as self-righteous and as vindictive as they do in Washington, where they, they, the, the United States ambivalence, the dupi duplicity, the, the, the Jekyll and Hyde aspect of the United States character, where we profess such high ideals, and yet traditionally we have ex exploited, we, we have engaged in activities that included uh, dropping atom bombs on women and children in Japan, eliminating large elements of the Indian population of this country, and in the past 30 years, killing well over 800,000 people in the third world under circumstances that can only be called terrorism, but doing it, pretending all the while to be idealistic, high-minded, human rights-oriented, freedom-loving people. Now, these values are brought together in the CIA, where people are diplomats by cover, and CIA agents <laughs> by trade. And when they have themselves exposed and have their children, their family, their friends find out that, hey, you weren't really a nice diplomat all these years. You were, in fact, running the Phoenix program in Vietnam that killed 40,000 people, including many innocent people. This isn't, this isn't something that makes these people feel good, and they get very angry. Moreover, the nation in, in the mid-'70s was clearly close to closing down the CIA to rejecting this kind of activity. So they were fighting for their existence. And there you get into the other driving force of their reaction against Lou Wolf and Bill Shap and myself and others is just simply exploitation, working uh, the, the thing against uh, the, the people who... Uh, there is a theory, which is, of course, nonsense, that Phil Agee was, was sent by the CIA to reveal names to create an atmosphere which would lead eventually to a, an official <laughs> secrets act. Now, that is certainly nonsense, and uh, it, in the, the extent to which it discredits a very honorable man, you know, I, but the fact is that they are exploiting this revelation of names extensively to effect the passage of an official secrets act. They were tr they've tried every other way over the past 30 years, every other way you could conceive of. They didn't succeed until modern times and the curious vacillation of the American public and Washington and the senators and, and uh, congressmen uh, in terms of just pure conservatism and, and callousness. Uh, and I think that uh, American people really have to understand that it is their rights uh, who, which are being threatened here. Now, uh, we are among many people, ones who reject the idea that it's more important to protect our rights than, than people in other countries. Clearly, that is not the case. Uh, uh, the minute 
we are involved in the torture or in the death of a single person in another country, our rights are being abridged and our tax money, to say the least, is being used and to carry it And our humanity is being violated because we're being asked to accept inhuman acts perpetuated in our name as Americans. Plus the fact that it eventually will come home. If they use it successfully right. overseas, they'll use it on the United States citizens as well. One of the most interesting aspects of this bill and the current environment in Washington is to project what it does to the legal system of a free society like ours in terms of the individual when you begin to give a, a, a special police, a secret police, a legal uh, priority, legal freedoms and rights over the citizens. We have some examples. We don't have to speculate. The bill isn't passed yet, and yet some of the things that have been happening in the last few years illustrate what we can look forward to. For example, one, to begin with a personal experience, I testified to the Senate uh, a, a little over a, year ago, over a year ago against this bill. I demanded the right to testify because they had ACLU testifying against it and journalists but no one who had been inside, who, who knew about cover and could say, this is bullshit, I was there, we didn't do it that way. Uh, they, they acquiesced and let me testify. Now, you have to write out a written statement before you testify and mm -hmm. submit it, and then you verbally introduce yourself on the floor of the Senate, I am so-and-so, and, -so and, what, and uh, then proceed to make a verbal statement, which parallels the written statement. The Senate Oversight Intelligence Oversight Committee submitted my written statement to the CIA for censorship the day before my testimony. <laughs> the CIA <laughs> struck out two parts which were in the public record, published in my book and republished in many magazines. Overt information which both of you have read and many other people in this nation, 40,000 people or so that bought my book have read, uh, which was not national security information but there were two things that I cited that showed the CIA's disregard for agents' cover. It just illustrated the fact that there was no, that they weren't secret agents. The CIA struck them out and returned the report, deleting these points. Now, I was meeting with the representatives of the Senate committee just before I went on to testify, and the Senate uh, uh, legal counsel the young attorney threatened me right outside their office. I didn't have a badge to get inside their office. We were standing in a little foyer outside. And I mean, finger in the chest, thump, thump, you know. And I'm warning you, John Stockwell, do not use the floor of the Senate to challenge CIA review like this. And I'm backing up like that. Then we walk into the... He didn't know you are an international karate champion. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then I went in to testify, and uh, I began to introduce myself, and Jake Garns uh, from Utah, uh, I was saying, you know, Stockwell, 19 years in the Marine Corps and Marine Corps Reserves, 13 years in the CIA, the wars and medals and whatnot, to establish the fact that I, you know, I have certain credentials for having served my country. And he inter interrupted me to say, I know who you are, you're a traitor, and everything about you fills me with loathing and disgust. And I said, Senator, <laughs> no one is going to say something like that to me anywhere. And he said, I just did, I have my freedom of speech too, and grinned at the cameras. And I said, yeah, but the difference is that I give you your freedom of speech, and you're trying to take mine away from me. Okay. Uh, in Frank Snepp's case, where the government sued him to take a civil suit to take, uh, take away the profits from his book, so-called, they took away all the, the gross re uh, proceeds, not just the profits, uh, they took him into the fourth, oh yes, he couldn't deduct his typing costs or whatever, they took away the gross of everything the book had made. Now, in the first day of hearing in the fourth district court under Judge Orrin Lewis, with uh, all kinds of, t of attorneys and journalists attending this thing, uh, Orrin Lewis made statements which uh, the Washington Post, three major newspapers in the nation were virtually calling for his impeachment the next day for the bias of his statements. He said that it would not be necessary to have a jury that he could handle it himself. 
He said that the facts in the case didn't interest him one damn bit. He said that uh, it was his objective to take away from Mr. Snepp his, quote, ill-gotten gains. That was before the trial even started. This was the first day. <laughs> this was in the first days of the thing. Now, he did biased this, open mind. He did this in front of, like I say, 50 attorneys who were there because of the, the, the unconstitution, the new law aspect of the case, and journalists, prominent journalists from all over the world. Now, the, the mo that's horrifying, but what's much more horrifying is what follows. Frank Snepp and his attorney were, were relaxed after that, figuring that whatever happened, they had it won in the appeals because of his incredibly prejudiced statements then and throughout the case. He kept interrupting uh, the, 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 the state's counsel uh, uh, to, to disallow, to protest Snepp's positions and vice versa. I mean, he was conducting the, the, the hearings. Now, Snepp and Mark Lynch, the ACLU attorney working with him, felt that they had it absolutely won in the appeals. When they got the court record to go to the 4th District Appeals Court in Richmond, Virginia, those statements had been expunged from the record. Wow. And the, re the appeals court refused to address itself to the fact that Orrin Lewis's prejudicial statements had been uh, written out. The judge had gotten to the court recorder and told him to type the thing up without those statements Is in that it. legal? What, what's the status That's of that? That's a pure, raw felony. <laughs> Orrin Lewis and uh, the, the, the court recorder, whoever did it, uh, should, you know, should get about 15 years for that. But the courts refused to consider the fact that the court record had been modified. There were 50 witnesses, mm. three newspapers calling for the man's, uh, imp virtually for the, ma the man's impeachment for his statements. And then when they get there, the court record, has, it doesn't say the same thing that all of these witnesses said it did afterwards. That's just one example. This, this also shows very graphically how if you have these police agencies like the CIA or the FBI getting out of control, how they corrupt the entire legal system. And then uh, the case of, uh, of Phil Agee that we mentioned previously in his passport hearing where the state is revealing names falsely claiming these men were killed in order to prove a point uh, to get broader legislation for the CIA. And then just a little case that has no implications in terms of names of agents, bills, or whatnot, freedom of speech, but it illustrates the point. Phil Litschke quit the CIA. He was writing a book about Koreagate, which I hope he gets published. It's truly a horrifying account of its own about the inside story of Korea. He submitted it for review, as the law requires him to do. They challenged it. Uh, and deleted a lot of things. So then he would write footnotes saying, the information blanked out in the above paragraphs discusses a high-ranking CIA official who was taken out by Korean police and gotten drunk and coerced and blah, 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 but without, you know, trying to come up with a footnote and then submit the footnotes for review. And he was truly a thorn in their side, and then they were having to address themselves to what of the footnotes could they, because, you know, they eventually have to defend these things in court. But anyway, he was working on his book very seriously with them through the review process. His wife was unstable, treated for mental problems in uh, psychiatric treatment. She, uh, they were in the process of getting a divorce. The CIA had its counsels work with her and work with her counsels. Now, they claim this was necessary to prevent her or the divorce proceedings from revealing national security information, but she wasn't an employee of the CIA. They had prominent CIA, I mean, GS-17 CIA officers go to the, he the divorce hearings and testify against Phil Litschke character assassination, saying things that his friends would absolutely deny in terms of his character and his stability. And when he and his attorney tried to cross-examine them, the court said no because of national security. They couldn't be questioned on the statements they had made about him, and they were permitted to walk out of the room without cross-examination. So they could stand up and destroy his character, lying while they did so, and walk away without being cross-examined. Now, see, the, the, the precedent in that case means that if the government begins to come after people, like they have to rewrite the whole legal system if they begin to prosecute people under the names of agents bill they can't you know the citizens defense of this was the truth 
this horrible thing was happening, which might make some points with the jury, cannot be brought out, they'll claim national security. So they will allow government witnesses to come in and testify uh, for the prosecution, but they will not allow them to be cross-examined to pull out the whole truth to defend the individual. Le this is what we're getting into with the new law. Legal new libel, state. legal libel, legal slander. Legal libel, legal slander, legal biased information, and depriving uh, the citizen, the defendant, of the right to defend himself, to, act, to get the full information out. It's a new law. It's a new era we're getting into. It's 180 degrees new from what this country is all about. And again, I repeat the irony that the, the beauty of it from the CIA's point of view is that the great mass of the American people, including the press and the movers of the society, are oblivious of what's happening. John, we wanted to thank you for coming on our show to revealing to our audience here exactly what's at stake in this name of agents bill. And we also want to tell you that next week we have some more revelations, some startling revelations about recent CIA activity with Lewis Wolf of the Covert Action Information Bulletin, who will be back, and John Stockwell will again comment on some of Lewis's revelations. We'll have some more updated stories about the CIA. So the CIA watch continues on Alternative Views. And now for some news stories. How many of you have heard of Sonoma State College? Well, it's in California. And each year they select the 10 most censored stories of the year. And those who don't quite make the top 10 are considered the, oh, 15 or 20 underreported stories of the year. How do they select this? Well, they have a panel, mainly a combination of press muckrakers and uh, people from the press itself, people from CBS or New York Times, and so, since 1976, they've been doing this, and very interestingly, every one of these top ten stories has been covered by alternative views, mainly because the stories originate or appear in the alternative press. For instance, the basic cause, this was in 1981, the top story was the basic cause of our economic crisis, monopoly, militarism, and multinationalization have destroyed America's free enterprise. The next story was Injustice of Greensboro, members of the Klan and the Nazis shooting down those uh, uh, labor leaders there. We covered these. The third one was Buying America and Radioactive, Burying America and Radioactive Waste. Uh, one, hungry, one child dies of hunger every two seconds, uh, and on and on and on. Anyway, these are all stories that we've covered, but nobody, nobody else. The one we missed was one which, well, it, it came across in the... Uh, Chicago Tribune. I don't like the Chicago Tribune. I guess you do either. I haven't seen that. But this is an incredible thing. I've never heard of this before. So this will close the gap, and now we'll be reported on all stories uh, since 1976. Did you know that there is a bank in the United States government which will fund projects which Congress does not approve of, or if Congress does approve, they only give them a pittance rather than as much as they want? And they give a uh, sample, or or if the federal or if the um, executive branch wants to do something quietly, they have this special little bank which does it. For instance, uh, NASA wanted a new satellite to track other sa other satellites, but it was afraid that Congress wouldn't approve the money. They wanted Western Union to do it, and they would finance it. Just hey, buddy, here's the money, and uh, and the government would. It was a straight loan from the government to them. This bank is in the office of the Federal Treasury Building in Washington and was reported back in 1979. The bank operates with just a handful of staff members, but it has extended some $65 billion in loans since it started in 1974. And this is more than the total outstanding loans of the Bank of America, the world's largest private bank. That's big bucks. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. I have an astonishing story here that I think will be on possibly Simona College's 10 biggest stories that's been neglected for this year. This is a story that I haven't seen reported on television or in any of the media, and it is the trial that's going on now of the top chemical testing company in America called the Industrial Bio testing laboratories that is now going on in a case that in these times, and a story on this, alleges is the most massive scientific fraud in U.S. history. 
Since 1953, the Industrial Biotesting Laboratories is the largest corporation in America that tests all of the chemicals that are used in herbicides, pesticides, that are used on many different products that we use daily. What these corporations do is they pay this corporation, Industrial Biotesting Laboratories, money to carry out tests to see if the products that these corporations want to sell are safe or not, and then the government takes a look at the tests and certifies on the basis of these chemical tests whether a product is or is not safe. Well, after seven years of government investigation, it appears that there has been massive scientific fraud in the testing that the bio um, test laboratories have been carrying out. In other words, they've been doing shoddy scientific research and testing. They've been covering over dangers in some of the products that we use, falsifying evidence, doing shoddy examination, making claims in tests that uh, they didn't really carry out, failing to experiment for certain dangerous chemicals and substances. So it could be that many, many products that are now on the market that went through this company are dangerous. To give you a sense of the magnitude of what's at stake here, the In These Times stories indicates that over 10,000 IBT studies have been carried out to register products for the American market, and at least 2,000 of them are primary research that no other testing company or no other government test was carried through to test the safety of these, these products. Moreover, independent Canadian and American scientists have called the majority of the studies that this corporation has carried out to be scientifically invalid, and they claim that almost all of the insecticides and herbicides that are on the market today, over 325 of them, that were certified by this company and their tests may not be safe at all. So this is a massive scientific scandal that may have a lot of importance for us because this may mean we've been using products that have really not been safe. And this hadn't been covered at all in the media that I've seen about, even though it seems to be a major story. The Wall Street Journal reports that doctors defrauding Medicare may face fines in excess of $100,000. The Health Department's Inspector General is readying civil penalties for doctors who double bill patients or charge for operations that they never perform. Officials also are investigating kickback payments by medical equipment suppliers to hospitals and therapists. There are several good books out on this subject, but one I thought was particularly good was called Tender Loving Greed by Mary Mendelssohn, and it chronicled abuses in the nursing home industry. And one of the things she says is, is a, a big scam in nursing homes nowadays that actually has the mob involved in it is the milking of the Medicare profits by rewriting loans. It seems that the mobs will buy up a whole chain of nursing homes and then funnel the Medicare and Medicaid money into rewritten loans at, uh, with uh, interest rates of like 40%, so that most of the money, instead of going to the patients themselves in the form of food and health care is actually going to the coffers of the mobsters. That's Tender Loving Greed by Mary Mendelssohn. It's an excellent book. This concludes the first of our three-part series on covert action featuring John Stockwell, former high CIA official, and Lewis Wolf, editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78712. Good night.